So uh, I'm Oli, this is Jakob. Uh, we have been working on these kind of things like compiler for a couple of years now, so two or three, I guess, right? And still, unfortunately, not too many people know about this kind of stuff. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, compilers as an intro and so on, but more specifically, if we are trying to get you to understand what is necessary for someone to actually write optimized code, because believe it or not, it's not just a matter of you specifying an option at a compiler command line. The compiler tries to do something, but it might not actually be what you're expecting it to be done. And so you will see a little bit in this direction, but uh, none of that will replace you actually doing something yourself in this area. And there's a lot, believe me, a lot which you can do and which you have to do to actually write highly optimized code. So. Um, for those uh, who know, well, let me first question, first a question. So who actually works on compilers and not with compilers, on compilers? All right, so that's your audience. <laughs> um, so a little bit of an overview, so what compilers are. So most of, for most people, it's a black box, but they are actually pretty structured in some way or form, you can see. Here, so we have, uh, as a compiler, the inputs are some form of source code, obviously, and, and for most of the programming languages, there's some form of library in whatever form it comes, including so from the system, so either text form, binary form, or whatever. It all is accumulated in a part of a compiler usually called the front end, so probably everyone heard about these kind of things. That's the part with, of a compiler, of the well-designed compiler system which is the only part uh, specific to a programming language. The rest of the compiler, if it is done correctly, is language independent. So for GCC, for instance, this means we have front ends for C, C++, Fortran, but also then for other things like whoever uses this, Go and D and whatever. So that these parts are completely uh, implemented only in the front end itself. The rest is identical. There might be some specific pieces in the rest of it for, which is tailored for a programming language, but uh, as, a, as in general, it's not. So everything is fed into the, the front end, then it's passed on to the various pieces. The second piece on the, on the slide, which you see here, is what's called the optimizer. So the optimizer itself is what, uh, what is the most interesting thing which most of this talk will be about. We don't have to execute the optimizer, but the uh, it, it, we can immediately proceed to generating code from this. And that part is the architecture-specific part of a compiler. So we have the uh, language-specific part in the front end, and we have the architecture-specific part in the back end. So that knows, for instance, you have x86, you have ARM, or whatever is this, and it knows how to generate code for that. And it spits out, in the end, what is called machine code, which is what the processor actually can execute then. So the, in the front end, so I have a little bit of an example code, so I took this from somewhere, so don't take this too seriously, the code, so everyone knows Euclid's algorithm to actually compute GCD, and that's the, uh, that's the, the code in a kind of a Python notation. I use that for various reasons, which should not be of interest here. So uh, the same thing, so what the front end basically does, that's uh, as a first step, is called tokenization. It spits out the serial code of the, of the program. In many cases, there are, uh, as in normal programming language, or many of the programming languages, it's independent of the, of the lines. In Python, it's depending that the line ending and so on also have a meaning. But in specifically, it creates a token for everything which is of substance inside the, the source code. So for this piece of, specific piece of code, for instance, I mean it's, it looks, can look something like that. So you have tokens, in this case, def is not just a character sequence, it's recognized as the keyword def in this case. For things which it does not recognize, they are variables. It says something like, oh yeah, this is a specific thing, it's a variable, and the name of the variable is, for instance, in the first, in a, the, the second box there, it's Euclid. That's one of the things. So this is the, the, the first task of the compiler. It's very boring stuff. If you read old compiler books, they are, they are harping on on these kind of topics. Nowadays, no one cares about this. We have tools to do these kind of things. The interesting thing is that once you get into the point that we have the, the tokenization form, this is still a very linear form. We have not yet discovered what it actually means for the nesting and for the dependencies of all this kind of code. 
This is then expressed in something called the abstract syntax tree, which is uh, an example which you can see here. So there is absolutely no uh, demand that there's a, there's a unified format for the a syntax tree. Every compiler comes up with its own form, and some of the compilers have multiple forms. So GCC, for instance, has multiple ways of representing the same information internally. So, but this is one possible way of representing, for instance, the abstract syntax tree for the program which we saw before. And now you can see this is not linear anymore. We actually uncover the structure of the program by encoding it into this kind of tree form. We see what is depending on what. That's part of the, uh, the, lang the language syntax and the, the grammar describes how I act, the compiler actually understands the source code to make this possible. So once we have that, we actually get to the point that we can do the next level, the more complicated level, and actually translate this into basic blocks. So, so uh, after the lexical analysis is done, after the syntax analysis is done by the front end, and perhaps some front end uh, language specific optimization, like that, usually compiler create uh, the control flow graph which is a directive graph. Which is a directed graph where the vertices are the basic blocks. Basic block is a is a sequence of statements. Uh, the important properties are that there are no jumps into the middle of the basic blocks and there are no jumps out of the middle of the basic block. Basically, you can have jumps to the start of the basic block and then from the end of the basic block, you have some branches as well. Uh, the edges in the graph are either normal, control flow, for instance, you can have a go-to, then it's, it's a single edge, or you can have conditional branch, then you have two edges. But uh, you can have other special kinds of edges. For instance, the exception handling edges are something when, when an exception is thrown, and that needs to be represented for the optimization to be able to find out other ways of control flow. Or for instance, uh, long jump and set jump have very complicated control flow as well, and that needs to be expressed in the, in the edges as well. In this, on, on this picture, you have the Euclid operation uh, lowered into, into simple operations. Uh, various compilers have different forms of the internal representation of the language. Usually, it's language neutral, and various compilers have multiple forms of the. Uh, internal representations, for instance, GCC starts with, with, with a code like this after the front end is passed to the middle end, and then, then this is lowered into static, uh, single static assignment form, which is something which has been developed by IBM in 1988. And these days, it's used in, in most of the compilers. Uh, the static, single static assignment form has, has a very good, some, some very good properties for the optimizations, namely that each variable is assigned just once. So you can stick various properties to these uh, assignments, or as I say, main versions, and this is achieved by uh, adding adding some subscript version of, of each variable. Uh, so if you assign to a variable a new value, you, you create a new uh, subscript for the variable. And this page shows some weird uh, functions at the beginning of some of the basic blocks. Those are phi nodes. Phi. And phi. So, and uh, that's a way how, how you express that the value, for instance, of A3 
is either A2 or I or A1, depending on which branch branched into this particular basic block. So the the point here is that with SSA we got through this uh, notation the possibility to actually express algorithms, optimization algorithms. So before we have this, there was really no way for, uh, for an algorithm to be really expressed as a kind of a formula. We had to say, yeah, we have this nth index tree of some sort, and if this and this condition is met, well, then we can potentially perform this kind of optimization. And the thing which I should have made before, every single optimization inside this optimizer and so on is a transformation in a mathematical sense. It's something which keeps the semantic of the tree completely intact while transforming one tree into another one where the second one is hopefully easier to compute. That's the whole thing. And when we are uh, defining optimization steps, we have to do this in some way or form. And SSA finally gave us the possibility to actually express this. We can write down specific algorithms in mathematical formulas. We can say if this, is this, uh, if this variable is in this set and not in this set and this condition is met, then you can do the following transformation on the block. That's the great thing about SSA. This is why everyone is using it. And if you're really honest and you really want to learn about opt writing optimized code, unfortunately, you have to learn about this as well, as Jakob will show us. So uh, for the optimizations, I would note that uh, the optimizations only care about valid programs. If they have undefined behavior, then it's completely valid to optimize it away or do anything. So the optimizations are based on the knowledge that valid programs should not have undefined behavior. Uh, for, uh, for the SSA form, I would note that not all variables are actually uh, transformed into the SSA form, uh, in, at least in GCC, uh, variables which, which are aggregates, structures, and so on, live in memory, and they need some different treatment, and variables where, which have address taken from them also need to be treated similarly. And you also see here the temp1 and temp2. So if you draw the line, theoretically, you can go back and see temp1, temp2 again. Well, the point here is that these variables live inside the block. Their, their usefulness or their use does not survive the stepping out of the block, and therefore, they also don't have to be handled. But once, once some program is converted into SSA form, basically, uh, it doesn't matter that much what, what the variables actually are. All you care about are the indexes of the uh, SSA versions. And in some compilers, the versions are unique in the whole function. Like in this example, you have A1 and B1, but uh, for instance, in GCC, you have A1 and B2 because you can't use the same version for, for multiple. So this makes it easy. You can just. And then after, after you do the tra this transformation, you, for most of the things except for debug info, you don't care what the variable originally was. It is just something that holds a value and holds it here. And you can hopefully see that this makes things so much easier. So you don't have to worry about the difference between different variables. It's just every single variable gets one value assigned for the entire lifetime, and every variable even after the mind has one single name. So that's uh, nice. This, this control graph also shows the loop. You can see there, there's a header with the A1 P node. That's the loop header. And there is a loop latch, which is the basic loop with A3, uh, which, is, which is the digitally single, single basic block inside of the loop that is uh, a predecessor of the loop header. Uh, if, if the loop has multiple latches, then some algorithms don't work very well, and, but it's, it's easier to transform them. So for instance, in this case, you, you could think that the two blocks above, uh, above the latch could, could have edges directly to the loop header. They can in some form, but you, you don't have multiple latches. So GCC has 
over 100 optimization passes, and some of the optimization passes do multiple optimizations as well. And it has also hundreds of optimization options. Uh, there is unfortunately no one-to-one one mapping between the options and the passes. And uh, while we have some infrastructure where, for instance, the minus O, some level options enable some, uh, some optimization options and disable others, uh, each uh, optimization pass has also some gate test which, uh, which says if, if the pass will be run at all. And th those gates can include not just the, the flags or the options which control the optimization, but also other properties like does this function have some loop or whatever else. And some, some of the passes also have sub-passes. So if they have gate in their own gate, and that gate says no, then no, no pass in the pass in, in from, from the sub-passes are, are run. And that's important, for instance, because you can see that many, many options, optimization options, are, if, if you dump uh, GCC options, or uh, uh, GCC minus minus help, or something similar, then it can show, even for minus O, zero, many, many optimization options enabled, but those passes are actually not run, because there are passes with many sub-passes which are gated on optimization being more than zero. So this is a little script which I wrote. You can see the address there. You can download it, uh, which tries to summarize this in some way or form. So this is information which is gathered from GC. So the important thing here, the most important thing I want to point out, the blue lines, these header lines, they list all the possible optimization options. There is no 099. <laughs> there used to be. Well, well, we parse it, and, we parse it and, and that's the point. So many people believe because the compiler accepts it, it is there. There is no 099. <laughs> believe me. You can say uh, IBM compiler actually shows the project because. Yeah, so there, there are some people who, who have this in the early, early Linux days, so uh, we have people who are leaving this and putting this in every single make file out there. And so, but, but these are the ones which exist out there, and the script, it would help you just discover this. So this is just a subset of, as Jakob said, we have 100 of them. This goes on screen after screen after screen to show you. But it helps you perhaps discover a little bit about what the, what the options are for each of these individual ones. So the thing is that if... It's, uh, if you don't like what the specific option, whether it's enabled for your O2 or 3 or whatever you're using, you can end or disable it individually by using the appropriate option there. So just use dash F and then the option name or dash F and O dash and then the option name to actually enable or disable it. You can individually do this and GC allows that. It's sometimes not advisable to dis uh, disable hundreds of optimization options because then you get into the era of uh, Yeah, but, but for some things, especially when you run into, into compiler bugs, very useful. <laughs> Aside from blaming him, so. <laughs> so this is the GCD algorithm written in C. So uh, just as a reference, because now we are going to compiler territory. This slide shows how you can use uh, f, f dump options to dump actual uh, text files which represent the inter uh, intermediate representation of the, of the program at each pass. Those files, as, oh, let's say, uh, the graph sub option uh, tells of the compiler to also emit a, <coughs> a dot file, a dot file which, which can be processed by dot, and you can create a picture from that which contains the CFG uh, visualization. Uh, so here, uh, the entry block is, is something uh, virtual, and 
So hopefully you can see the correspondence between the code and also be between the correspondence of the of the asked uh, the abstract industry from the previous slide. This is exactly this kind of thing, the, exactly the same structure. And the compiler can construct this, even for very large ones. So dot comes from the GraphWiz pro, uh, uh, project and so on for the package if you install it. It works reasonably well even for large graphs. And I at least, I don't know whether Jakob is still using, I always use this kind of thing when, when I'm hunting for things which uh, don't, uh, don't comp compile to the code which I expect it to, to do. I like it better than the textual representation in some cases. But the, the, the one here, you would see here on the bottom there, so it's hinted, that's exactly the same information. Exactly the same. Uh, the, the way how, we, how it's actually represented, at least for the, you know, well, the, as I said, the GCC has multiple internal representations, and uh, one major one is, is Simple, which is which is statements written in too polite form, and that's that's what you can see here. This is from very early pass, uh, right after the uh, CHE construction. So there is still no SSA form, no, yeah. but it's it, you, you already have the CHE. Mm -hmm. We have some other examples later on where SSH information is in there, and then you can see also correspondence there. And uh, the, the uh, machine generator part of the compiler uh, uses a different uh, intermediate language, uh, which, which, which is at least written lispy like. And this is much more closer to the actual instructions, but still, still common enough that you can use many optimizations which are common to all the architectures and the, uh, the dumps, the textual dumps are, uh, uh, are numbered from the first pass to the, the following ones and the T1 indicates the game called the tree. There are also I dumps which, which are for the in, interprocedural optimization <coughs> and there, then there is R which is for the RTL the, the language. Uh, for the gimbal dumps the language is C like except that there the, the basic blocks are expressed there and the P notes are written as, as uh, comments after, after double hash uh, debug uh, statements are written similarly. It's, it's not exactly C, but it's close. And if you want, you can nowadays write programs in Gimple. <laughs> we, we have a, yeah, we have a part of that. <coughs> so this shows if we have many passes and uh, the slides. So at the top you see there, so it's, it's OFAT, it's a Euclid program again, compiled with this, except that it uses a little compiler plugin which I wrote again, at the bottom there you can get it, which just prints the, the name of the pass. So this is a subset, it's not even everything, it's a subset of the passes which GCC does if it runs with all the optimizations or almost all the optimizations enabled. Again, not, not all passes do, some, some passes exit early and don't, do, don't actually walk the CFG or, or the intermediate language. Other passes do walk it, but you don't find anything interesting there. Well, in, in this program specifically, you can imagine, that's not that much to, com to optimize. But still they're running. Uh, these, these are the dumps. Again, the list is incomplete because it doesn't even include the uh, I, I pass. Yes, you see at the bottom there, so 200, there are 252 files after I do that in the directory, so huge amount. So, and this is, this is a dump from the end of the, uh, of the Gimple or tree uh, optimizations when we remove the SSA form. Uh, some other compilers keep the SSA form even, even longer until the register allocation. We do not, but we, we still keep the basic blocks around until end of compilation, but just switch the 
language in the basic form. <coughs> and what, what you can see there is there on the edges, uh, there are probabilities. Uh, those are either guessed by various algorithms, uh, and like if, if you are testing for non-null pointer, then uh, then we predict it as, as, as likely that the pointer is non-null and <coughs> many other heuristics like that. Or the probabilities can be measured actually. Uh, that's what we call uh, feedback directed optimization, profile guided optimizations, where, which is something which is very useful, especially for, for compute intensive applications that when you actually build them, uh, that you build them twice, once with special option that tells them to gather this information, then you run the application with some typical uh, workload, and this generates some data which counts for the different edges and other information like uh, the length of the string copied by string instructions and so on and and then you run the compiler again and it uses this information instead of the guest information and you know this this part of code is code and so can be optimized for size and this part is important so let's vectorize it and let's do other optimizations on so it is quite important. Also, you have the possibility to overwrite this. So for a long time, we have built in expect as a compiler built in. And C++ uh, 17 has likely unlikely attributes, which you can just use. Then you're overwriting whatever you get. And that, in, that information will then be plugged in. I think it's 90, 10, 90%, 10% or something like this, right? Is there, is then you will find then in the branches. And that's is quite important. So. Also for you to look at, so if you look at your program and you know where the, the hot loop is, you can look at this and make sure that that part actually is annotated appropriately in, in, in the compiler generated data structures though. Because as Jakub said, the compiler will use this information to guide the level of optimization we are doing. So not everything gets heavily in the out, so in loop unrolled, for instance, or vectorized or something like this, this would blow up the code size. It would also potentially uh, uh, make things for some, some, piece, uh, some, some situations actually worse. So the compiler is concentrating the heavy duty optimizations, which might require a lot of compilation time, might allow, uh, require a lot of memory at runtime, to those parts which it knows will be executed more often. So if you have a loop which is then always there and you have an if which handles an error condition which almost never happens, you never want to spend much effort on that. And you can mark this explicitly or through PGO and so on, have, have this automatically uncovered by running your code and then recompiling using the information. So this is something which is not new. So the, the PGO staff, the profile guided optimization part, have been in there for 15 years at least, something like that. So that's something which everyone should have already know about and, uh, and use in their programs. The only thing is that you actually need to have a representative workload for you to actually run on the code before you do the recompilation, and that's what most often breaks things. Because sometimes if you run the test suite, then the test suite covers the corner cases and not the usual workload. On the other side, if you write just simple benchmark, then then the benchmark will be fast, but not the other stuff. So the workload needs to be typical for the application. And uh, what GCC does is also an optimization which splits the function into multiple code sections. One is for cold code and one is for for the hot code. And in that case as well, for, for the cache, uh, iCache, you want the hot code to be Not together. together. So and that's the, uh, the title, uh, sorry, it's the book, that's this. This is the only real book which I still know, so which handles really SSA as an optimization and so on. So if you're really interested in this, I think that's still the book to get. It's quite old, 2004. So these are various exam simple examples of optimizations. 
the difficult uh, elimination is removing uh, non-useful code. Uh, there are actually two kinds of dead code elimination in that function. One is uh, the return f can be optimized by uh, removal of unreachable code. Basically, you create a basic block, and then you find the guarding condition is never true because uh, unsigned value is never smaller than zero. And so you, you throw it away immediately. And the other dead code elimination is afterwards because you have then the temp variable which is assigned some value and you never use it and it has no side effects so you can be thrown away as well. Dead store elimination is usually for memory. In this case it's, it's more like uh, dead code elimination again but if you thought about L as being memory, something that has to live in memory, then the value in memory, you write A2 is then overwritten by writing the result from the function to, and then, and then it's not used even until the end of the function, so you can again uh, remove the starts. Of course, if you don't know about the fun or what the function is, uh, whether it has any side effects, you still need to call it. Common sub expression elimination is something which is done in several places in GCC, both on the Gimbal and on the RTL as well. It's done through some value numbering and finds out that the two expressions are common and can just use a temporary. Uh, on, on the gimbal, it's usually called uh, full, redundant, full redundancy elimination, partial redundancy. So in, in this case, uh, what I oftentimes see people, they're making their code ugly because they think, oh yeah, I don't want to, uh, want, want to write something like this again, even though this might, to someone who's observing the code, easier to understand than introducing yet another obscure variable somewhere on something like this. So in general, you don't have to worry about this. The compiler is pretty good at doing this. So this is an optimization which has been around for decades, and we are pretty good at that. And, and then it, it shows also an, a possible optimization that if you, have, if you compare the, if you test for a range of a TMP uh, variable, then it can be done more efficiently than two conversions. In this case, by subtracting the low value and comparing. Uh, actually, the comparisons should be done in already in unsigned type so that it doesn't trigger undefined behavior later on. Uh, there are other optimizations for the comparisons of a set of values, like you can use and not before the subtraction or after it, and that can uh, cover even bigger sets of values. So uh, this just shows the common sub-expression elimination actually work, and that, the, uh, that the, so so there is just just a single underscore two. Oh, uh, I haven't mentioned that the syntax for writing SSA SSA variables in GCC is that it's some variable name underscore and and the uh, uh, version number, and if, there, uh, if the variable name is missing, then it's anonymous SSA, name, SSA version, and it just doesn't bind to any, any variable, it's, it's, it's temporary. And at the start of the function, there is a list of the types of so you see here, that's the SSA form. It has a phi node here at the end. So you see phi, it comes, I'm the first node comes from, uh, it's a value 12, you can, which you can see is in basic block three. So BB, basic block, uh, comes there. And the second one is zero, which comes from two. So it's an absolute value. It's not a variable. So this is in this notation also possible. And that's, you can directly translate that into this, into the code, which you see on the right-hand side. So this is actually pretty easy to understand what you, once you get over the hump and this with this strange phi stuff. And even without the parser, it's actually not very hard to transform it even to valid C. <coughs> just a 
variables are declared, and you can use just the valid variables, and you just need to find out something for the piece. Yeah. Yeah. So this shows another optimization, uh, which is value range propagation. GCC does this only for a subset of types, like integers or uh, pointers to some extent. Uh, it doesn't do it yet for vectors, and it doesn't do it for floating uh, point values, which in some cases might be interesting as well. Uh, so what the value range for propagation figures out is that because of the test in if uh, uh, in the else block uh, the, the value of A is always smaller or equal to 3 in that case it can optimize the way one of the cases from the switch because it will never happen and another thing which it does is it's able to build the value range for the A uh, at the return statement because the if it's if it's initially uh, bigger than three, then then it will be uh, bigger than zero, and if it's if it's initially three, then it will be thirteen, and if it's otherwise it's, it will be zero. You can see it in the final. See the final block that the final node it has a three or zero or thirteen. <coughs> so the compiler does a pretty good job. And so the. A, A is smaller than zero, this can be optimized. Now, <coughs> we can actually do the same thing even if there is A plus, plus equals three. And here, the reason for that is that this is done in the integer type, in the signed integer type. And in, in C, C++, it's undefined behavior if the operation wraps around. So this is an important thing to see. So I, I put this in deliberately so because people don't expect this. So the optimizer, as Jakub said at the very beginning, we are only doing tr the transformations based on the assumption that the code is correct. Incrementing an integer variable so that it wraps around is an ill-formed program, and you cannot expect anything from the optimizer at that point. It will transform it to the code, which is exactly the same as the previous one, but all of a sudden, if you look at the variable A at that point later on, it will actually be negative, but the compiler would treat it as positive. Hey, you're writing bad code. <laughs> There are sure, some, some use it, but these are lousy programmers. Yeah. But so, but that's the thing. So, if you cannot handle that, O zero is your friend. So, live with that. But even sometimes O zero does some optimizations as well. Yeah. All right, we have to go. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, for this, I would mention that we have the sanitizers, F sanitize equals something. And UB you can use, uh, use yep. that to find at runtime the bugs in your code. Uh, by integer mean sign, or uh, does it hold true even for unsigned? Uh, for unsigned, the bracket is, is well defined in, at that point. So, so if you want to make it well defined, just cast it to unsigned. And cast it again uh, to integer, then it's implementation defined in C actually. In C++ is now well defined because it forces the choose component every <coughs> All right, so th this is another thing. So when we are looking at optimizations and so on, oftentimes it's not obvious when the compiler, which of the compiler passes or whatever kicks in. So in GCC 9, one of our uh, colleagues has added an option called, as you see it there, app safe optimization records to GCC itself, which writes out yet another file which you can get. In this case, it's based on the file name, then dot opt record dot json.js, so it's a compressed JSON file which oftentimes has tremendous amounts of data in it. Unfortunately, the, 
we are at the very beginning of using this file, but uh, it's really not usable in, uh, by looking uh, yourself, looking at the code itself. So I wrote yet another script, the third one today, uh, which you can also get called opmark in this case. So if you get that and run it on one of these JSON files which are generated, it, prits, uh, it annotates the source code with the information from this file. And this gives you then information about what the compiler actually rejected. In this case, for instance, red lines means, so red lines with this thing means, oh yeah, this is a negative thing. It says the compiler couldn't do this operation. For some things, it actually would show, oh, yeah, I did the following optimization, et cetera. And the other ones are annotations which the compiler currently spits out. So we are at the very beginning of using these kind of things. Thanks. So this is something which we have to work on a lot more for GC10 at least. So I will have to work with what David is on to actually make this much more usable. Don't expect the world from this right now. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So because the compiler doesn't emit all the information, the script should work most of the time. But uh, well, if you find some use for that or you find some problems with this, so let me know. Dave, Dave Malcolm is the one who actually wrote the other code. So we're actually looking at that. So we have now a couple more slides where this, so we are supposed to uh, finish off, so I, but we already took, the, took some of the, uh, the questions, so let's go on a couple more minutes. Here are a couple of examples of optimizations. So the first one is called tail calls. So anyone who has ever done functional programming, especially scheme, something like that, knows the term because there's a well-defined mechanism. This is that a function uh, which calls another function as the very last uh, operation, can in theory uh, be generating code for which does not return to the intermediate function. So in this case, the function f. So that's a good thing. So you see on the right-hand side, the second uh, the block there, C1 fi, that's the implementation of the fi function for a correctly performed tail call optimization. So it, instead of using the call instruction, it actually jumps to the other function after doing something. So oftentimes you have to actually work to make this work. So for the second on the second row in the right hand column here, you see that there's some additional operation which is performed on the on the tail called function and so on. In this case, of course, we cannot perform tail call optimization because we have to add one to this. So this is nothing the compiler can actually handle by itself. You have to do something. So if uh, using tail call optimization can be really really useful because. If you have lots and lots of recursion, which looks like recursion in there, but you use tail call optimization, you don't use up the stack. So this is really important in simple situations. And languages like Scheme actually demand tail call optimization. But to make it work, you actually have to rewrite the code a little bit. So, but uh, there are man other things which are standing in the way. And this you only discover if you're looking at the code. So take a look at the, the code on the, on the left hand side again. It looks like normal tail call operations. So similar to the code which you saw on the previous slide, so it has tail to something like this. But there's a little bit of code in there in the middle, so at the beginning of the function. And that code, code screws everything up because after the tail call and so on, the compiler thinks, oh yeah, I have to generate some code to actually unwind the stack frame. So I already bothered, bothered uh, Jakob earlier today. This list optimization GCC actually doesn't escape analysis on, on which variables escape, and if they escape, like in this case, then, uh, then it stops doing the telephone optimizations, but the thing is that uh, while the string escapes, it actually uh, is, is that it is not alive because the scope in which it's de declared it goes outside. So the, so the, the time the telephone is called... So the, Delete, so the destructor for the string could have been called before, but it isn't. GCC doesn't handle it, so it prevents tail call optimization. So again, this is something which you have to do explicitly. Next slide. So if you rewrite the code slightly in this case, and this comes from a real world example. I did this for a project, another project out there. So I come to continue to basically this kind of patch where I then said, so I split out the code into, into a separate function. Specifically, in, this case, in, a, in that case, it was some error handling, but also to get tail call optimization. In this case, I have a function which I mark as not inlineable. So, and in this case, I'm actually getting the code which you see here. It's much, much shorter than what we had before. So this is possible, but it's oftentimes not possible automatically. So you have to actually look at the code because you have no information from the compiler actually saying, oh, I didn't do this. Yeah. You already see, so. 
for, for this, uh, for the talk. So I came up with all kinds of examples, and, and Jakob as well, and everything time, why didn't GCC do this automatically? Why didn't it do it automatically? So yeah, it's, it's bugfighting bonanza here. So you saw this kind of code before. I had, this, had the, the case statement. So what if you know that in the function g here, the parameter a, actually can only have a couple of values? But the function f in this case here is a general one. For instance, this can be error handling. But in some cases, you might know, well, the error which I get here can only have the following error codes. So how do you do this? So the full code is actually pretty long. It has a, has a conditional jump in there and has a long table. But if you just add a little bit of code in there, so the highlighted pieces here, which you see here, that's a compiler intrinsic called built in uh, unreachable, which tells the compiler that if it gets in here, well, basically, this cannot actually happen. This branch is dead, which means that the other part, the else part, so the consecutive ones, for those, the condition of the if actually holds. This is a way to tell the compiler, I know something about this variable. We have contracts coming up, so that's a different thing, so yeah. But, but this kind of thing exists today, and they can have a remarkable impact on the code, which, the code quality you are getting out of a compiler. But you have to be really careful if you use this, because if the code isn't actually unreachable, then the optimizer is going to screw everything. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but again, again, the sanitizers are able to catch it, because instead of uh, having something, well, they transform the built-in un unreachable into a library code, which. Uh, Kills the application and so on. For example, yeah. with hmm? other compilers, so other compilers can use the same. Why would you use another compiler? You're talking to GCC guys. <laughs> That's nasty talk. <laughs> All right, so last class of uh, things we are talking about is vectorization. Um, yeah, so Jakob, you, you do that. Yeah, uh, so this is a loop which can be. On, on many targets, like in this case, ADX2 with, and, but we, we forced, uh, so, so that the code is smaller, we forced 128 bits vectors. Uh, it can be vectorized either way, uh, but if, if you don't tell the compiler that the res and A arrays or whatever objects they, they point to don't overlap, uh, the compiler has to insert some additional runtime checks, which check that those uh, two errors don't compile. Yeah. So you see there, this prepare. In, there, it's in the prepare loops. In the prepare loops there. So you, you get very large code and, and some runtime check. So yeah. But if, if in, in many in, in many cases you know that those those two don't overlap, and there are many ways written in this uh, test case how you can tell the compiler about that. C has the restricts, plus plus doesn't, but... Uh, well, we have underscore restrict. Underst understands that. Yeah. Or you have pragmas, especially for that. So this, yeah. this is one of the differences between C, C++, and Fortran. And if people come from the Fortran side, they forget about restrict and get bad performance, because in Fortran, you cannot have overlapping objects. And that's, that's why sometimes if you try hard in C++, you still don't get what, what you yeah. get with Fortran. So and here you see why we, why we are harping on this. The first three instructions there, they have a P in there, in, in, in the monomic name. And that indicates that these are vector instructions. It actually do, performs multiple instructions at the same time. So in this case, two uh, doubles in this case, but you can have it more. And if you use the full ABX 512 or ABX 5, uh, or 256, you get even more out of this. But then you have some, something after the loop. So starting from this L3 label, which you see here, this is the cleanup part. So this is when you have an odd number of array elements, then you have to do something as an, on the scalars, and that's what happens there. So. But again, if you know that L will be always a multiple of 16 or something, then you can, again, tell the compiler about that using, for instance, the built-in unreachable, and it will be able to optimize the way that scalar loop at the end. So that's quite important. So, yeah. so we have to uh, be 
out here, Queen, go to the next slide, I think. We have just a couple more examples on vectorization. So we have the possibility to have functions like square root and this kind of thing. There are, on Linux at least, there are parallel versions of that. So there, are, in, in this case, we don't even have to do this because it's not the library function, it's an, it's an instruction on most of the architectures, but for things like sine, cosine, tan tangent, and exponential logarithm, and so on, we actually have parallel versions for that, which do, that's the computation of the values multiple times, and we can still paralyze these loops completely. So this works really well nowadays. But the test case shows that if, if you try it with, for instance, O2 or O3, it actually doesn't work because, uh, POSIX, I think, mandates that the square root sets are now if, if the value is, is smaller than zero. And that's a very unlikely case, and that's why GCC normally for the scalar code uses the hardware instruction and then just compares the value against zero. And if it's, if it's smaller than zero, then in some cold code actually calls the original function to do the yeah. Erna handling. And that's what breaks the yeah, so we have to count down. And that's why you need to use OFAST or something. Yeah, so FFAST and so no, OFAST both work around these kind of things. And the other one is another one. So we'll make the, the slides available. There's only one more slide there. So um, hopefully you get an impression how complicated this is actually write optimized code and, uh, and how hard the compiler actually works behind the scenes. And to actually verify that the code you are, uh, the compiler generates for you actually corresponds to what you think. There's no way you have to either look at the Gimpel code, uh, perhaps at the flow graphs, or you have to look at the assembly code. You cannot just magically tr trust the magic of the compiler doing the right thing all the time. All right, hopefully you got an impression, so thanks.